Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. We take a closer look into one of the migrant facilities in Texas. Images show children packed into overflowing pods. An activist has more on what the border surge may mean for victims of sex trafficking. The U.S. and its allies are taking a stand against human rights atrocities committed by the Chinese regime, sanctioning officials involved in serious abuses. Will Beijing retaliate? More than 20 states are trying to limit girls' sports to biological girls only, and South Dakota is one of them. The state's governor is also forming a new coalition. After much scrutiny following the 2020 presidential election, Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger will face a challenger in the 2022 Republican primary. And his challenger has just received a big endorsement. An anti-lockdown protests spring up around the world. These demonstrations mark a year since virus prevention measures took off globally. That and more on NTD News. Breaking news, there's an active shooter at King Scooper's gal- grocery store at Boulder, Colorado. ABC says there are reports of injuries, but no further details are available right now. The U.S. and its allies are putting sanctions on certain Chinese officials. These individuals allegedly gave have links to what the U.S. calls a genocidal campaign against the Uyghurs in China's western Xinjiang region. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the details. The United States, Canada, Britain and the European Union have all put sanctions on several Chinese officials who are allegedly involved with serious human rights abuses in Xinjiang, western China. Britain's foreign minister Dominic Robb spoke in London on Monday about the reason for the international effort. Mr. Speaker, in terms of scale, it's the largest mass detention of an ethnic or religious group since the Second World War. And I believe one thing is clear, the international community cannot simply look the other way. The U.S. sanctioned one official from a regional police unit and one from a state-owned paramilitary construction company. The U.K. focused on the same entity. Rob describes why. Alongside these individuals, we are also designating the Public Security Bureau of the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. That's the organization, Mr. Speaker, responsible for enforcing the repressive security policies across many areas of Xinjiang. The alleged abuses include arbitrary detention and torture against Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. That's according to the Treasury Department. State Secretary Antony Blinken describes the Chinese repression against Uyghurs as genocide. Blinken issued a joint statement saying the evidence of violations is overwhelming. It says the Chinese Communist Party's or CCP's own documents, along with satellite images and eyewitness testimonies, show mass detention in internment camps and forced sterilizations. It says these are aimed at destroying the Uyghur heritage, thus the sanctions. Unsurprisingly, the Chinese regime retaliated immediately by sanctioning 10 EU politicians and four entities for what they call, quote, maliciously spreading lies and disinformation. Blinken recently said the U.S. will work in solidarity with its allies to hold China accountable. He says that's more effective than targeting China one-on-one. He said they are doing this to demonstrate their commitment to guarding human rights and to shine a light on the CCP's atrocities. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. New Zealand and Australia echoed those same concerns. Their foreign ministers are calling on China to end its repression against Uyghurs and other religious minorities. And they're demanding the Chinese regime release those who are locked up without reason. And the outer fencing surrounding the U.S. Capitol started coming down this weekend. Some streets are opening back up to traffic, but there is still fencing right around the Capitol building without a set date on when that will come down or if it will at all. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more from the Capitol. Tourists and Washington, D.C. residents out here enjoying this beautiful sunny day. For many of them, this is the closest they've gotten to Capitol Hill since January. Over the weekend, they started taking off bits of this black fence that has been surrounding the Capitol. We spoke to some residents and tourists to see how they're feeling about having one less area of D.C. under lockdown. But it's about time. It was terrible. And I don't think America knew this fence was six miles around the city turning their favorite bike ride into a tough trek. The barricades forced them to ride along the freeway. And a tourist family called it a pleasant surprise to see the area open. 
Um, from far it looked like it's still fenced, but getting closer um, makes us happier to see that part of the fence is gone, which kind of signals recovery and return to normal situation. A memo sent to Capitol staff said the changes are being made because there's no longer a credible threat against Congress. But Capitol Police say plans could change if officials learn of any new threats. One mother of a National Guard member deployed to the Capitol says her heart goes out to the troops. I feel sorry for my child, let alone all these soldiers. They sent them over there to guard the place, but then all of a sudden they kick them all out and send them somewhere else where there's no utilities, I heard, and my daughter can see that. Congressional leaders now discussing a new $2 billion plan to improve security around the Capitol. And some citizens say it's important to ramp up security long term. I think it's a safety thing. And uh, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, I'd like to see something more permanent, though. It looks kind of uh, temporary. But some others are not too happy to put taxpayer dollars towards the effort. We should start taking it from Congress paycheck in their pensions. You, you know, how, why is Congress immune to everything that they're doing to us? Previously, the street was blocked to traffic, but bit by bit, they've taken down some of this fencing here. They're still working on the remaining bit right here. Now, closer to the Capitol, it's still blocked off by some fencing, and it's unclear how long that will be there. We know members of Congress are looking for an alternate approach to security here on Capitol Hill. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. In Louisiana, there is a new congresswoman-elect. She won the state's 5th district on Saturday night. NTD's Steve Lance has that story and more from around the Capitol. Hi, Steph. First, we go to Louisiana, where Dr. Julia Letlow makes history by winning a special election in Louisiana's 5th district. The congresswoman-elect will fill the seat of her late husband, Luke, who won the election in November but passed away just before being sworn into office. Shortly after her husband passed away, Letlow said she felt a calling and peace from the Lord that pushed her to run for office. Letlow ran as a pro-life constitutionalist who says she will protect the rights of her constituents. She received an official endorsement from former President Trump on March 10th that sought to propel her to victory. Congresswoman-elect Letlow says she'll focus her attention on promoting agriculture in her district because of the state's prominence on the Mississippi River and will also help jobs and small businesses grow. And Representative Tom Reed of New York says he won't be running for re-election in 2022. The congressman has been accused of sexual misconduct by a former lobbyist. Reed issued a statement apologizing to his accuser. The former lobbyist Nicolette Davis told the Washington Post about the sexual harassment in a story that was published on Friday. According to the Washington Post, Davis accuses the congressman of inappropriate touching while they were at a pub in Minnesota during the time she was a lobbyist. Reed apologized to Ms. Davis for what he called his perceived disrespect and unprofessionalism. He went on to apologize to his wife, kids, and the people of the 23rd District. And another high-profile election battle is unfolding in the upcoming Republican primaries. Today we found out Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger will be challenged for his seat by Georgia Representative Jody Heiss. Raffensperger came under fire by the Trump administration for his handling of the 2020 election recounts. Trump, who vowed to campaign against Raffensperger, quickly endorsed Heiss, calling him one of the most outstanding members of Congress. Heiss said, quote, if elected, I will instill confidence in our election process by upholding the Georgia Constitution, enforcing meaningful reform, and aggressively pursuing those who commit voter fraud. Trump also said he will campaign against Georgia Republican Governor Brian Kemp, who he believes failed to act properly when presented with claims of voter fraud. The governor of South Dakota is defending girls' sports against what she calls unfair competition from biological boys. This, as more than 20 states are considering doing the same. NTD's Allison Lee has more on that. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem is announcing a coalition that seeks to defend Title IX and stand up against potential backlash from the National Collegiate Athletic Association, or NCAA. The coalition will uh, consist of athletes, leaders, and everybody who cares about protecting women's sports. Once we have enough states on board, a coalition brought big enough where the NCAA cannot possibly punish us all, then we can guarantee fairness at the collegiate level. 
The governor says this new initiative is necessary because legal scholars predict that South Dakota will very likely lose in the case of a lawsuit against the NCAA. If South Dakota passes a law that's against their policy, they will likely take punitive action against us. That means they could pull their tournaments from the state of South Dakota, they could pull their home games, they could even prevent our athletes from playing in their league. That's their prerogative. South Dakota passed a new bill earlier this month. It would restrict girls' sports to biological girls, but Governor Nome sent it back to the legislature and asked them to make certain revisions. I'm still excited to sign the bill. Nothing's changed. Some of those uh, portions of the bill that we need to fix are those that create a trial lawyer's dream. Uh, there are incredible opportunities for lawsuits and litigation in this bill that don't need to be there. She says, for example, the definition of performance-enhancing drugs in the bill is too vague. She wants to limit the bill to K-12 through sports, not the collegiate level. And the governor also says an athlete's gender should be proven using the birth certificate at the time of birth. Instead, the current bill would require families to prove their children's gender every year. Over 20 states have introduced similar legislation, and Mississippi's governor already signed one into law. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. A lot of people, not just in the U.S., are fed up with pandemic lockdowns. So much that they've made it a somewhat weekly tradition to protest on weekends. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the latest international demonstrations and virus trends. We've experienced crippling but expert-approved pandemic lockdowns for over a year now. And to mark the one-year anniversary, people held international anti-lockdown protests over the weekend. They're saying things like, we are all essential. Our team in Toronto got this footage, but there were also protests across Europe and some in the United States. In the U.S. alone, 770,000 people filed for unemployment as of the 13th of March. 4.1 million people are already getting unemployment benefits as of March 6th. And the unemployment rate is still nearly double the pre-pandemic level. Now let's touch on the AstraZeneca vaccine. An international study says this COVID-19 vaccine was 79% effective at preventing symptomatic cases in adults and seniors. About 30,000 people took part in that study and they didn't find any serious side effects or an increased risk of blood clots. Dr. Anthony Fauci says it's now the FDA's turn to look over these results. The FDA is going to very, very carefully go over all of these data. There will be an application for an EUA, and I can tell you, you can rest assured that the FDA will put a great deal of scrutiny in every aspect of these data. If it's cleared, AstraZeneca will be the second non-mRNA vaccine available in the U.S. Virus positivity rates are rising in some states, like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, which has it the worst. Their seven-day case average has gone up since late last month. Last daily average recorded was nearly 4,000 cases on Sunday. Nationally, we've hovered around a 53, 54,000 average, still far lower than January's peak, which was more than four times higher. Lastly, the CDC director says variants are spreading more widely, like the B117 variant first detected in the UK. And the B117 variant is estimated to be responsible for 9% of cases in New Jersey and 8% in Florida. In early February, Dr. Fauci and the CDC director said they expected this variant to predominate other types in the U.S. by the end of March. Well, it doesn't look like we're close to reaching that estimate. We're nearing the end of March, and so far only 6,390 cases of this variant have been reported to the CDC. That's it for this pandemic roundup. Steph, back to you. Thanks, Miguel. And an update on New York's vaccination plan. Starting tomorrow, New Yorkers aged 50 and older will be eligible for a COVID-19 vaccine. And the Supreme Court could reimpose the death sentence for the Boston Marathon bomber. The lower court initially set aside the death sentence, but the government wants it back. 
The justices agreed to hear an appeal filed by the Trump administration, but the case won't be heard until the fall. The initial decision to seek the death penalty was under the Obama administration. Although it's unclear how the Biden administration will approach the case, Biden has pledged to seek an end to the federal death penalty. The now 27-year-old bomber was convicted of all 30 charges against him. He and his brother set off two bombs at the Boston Marathon in 2013. But lawyers argue he is less to blame than his brother, who they say was the mastermind behind the attack. The first photos from inside two of the child migrant facilities have been leaked to the public. The children can be seen in camped facilities. This as DHS struggles to find ways to house them all. And amid the border surge, an expert is concerned about child sex trafficking. Our first look into a temporary overflow facility for migrant youths in Texas since the surge at the border. These leaked photos, provided by Democratic Texas Representative Henry Cuellar to Axios. And these obtained by undercover journalist nonprofit Project Veritas. These photographs were taken in the last few days. There are eight pods with eight cells in each facility. At any given moment, there are an average of 3,000 people in custody. Jakob Boyens, the founder of a nonprofit dedicated to combating child sex trafficking, is calling what's taking place at the border a disaster. He's extremely concerned about the children coming into the country and where they will ultimately end up. That the cartels, MS-13, every drug cartel is now in trafficking children. All of them traffic children. The, the current predators, the, the, ant, the sex trafficking community inside our prison system, the gangs in the prison system, how they are literally waiting for these children to come across the border. Boyan says that roughly 30 percent of children who cross the border in any given year fall prey to predators or sex trafficking. And he says despite CBP's best efforts, there's no way to ensure these migrant youths actually end up in the care of family members in the U.S., especially, he says, when the system is overloaded. You cannot ensure they're going to a safe house. And any politician left or right side of the aisle that's guaranteeing you that they're going to a safe house is absolutely lying to your face. There's no way for them to track that. We're being, we're being so overrun at the border. Statistics aside, Boyens also speaks from firsthand experience. Since he helps rescue children every day, Boyens says he personally intercepted a young migrant child on a Delta Airlines flight. He says the child had documentation to cross the border, saying he was going to family members in Tennessee. Boyens says they tracked it and there was no family there. This is an eight-year-old boy traveling by himself, alone. And when I got an interpreter to, to interpret to the child, and there's an Hispanic man with he goes, I don't know this guy. This is not my father. He says the system to deal with victims is already overrun, with both anti-sex trafficking organizations and law enforcement lacking resources and funding. And Boyan says the White House is not addressing this issue. And I want to see more action from the White House right now. There's silence from the White House regarding sexual exploitation of American children, never mind children that's coming across the border. As of March 14th, U.S. CBP agents were holding over 13,000 unaccompanied children in custody. Grace Coulter, NTD News. And the Biden administration is set to spend close to $87 million to house family units crossing into the U.S. illegally. It awarded a short-term contract to nonprofit organization Endeavors. It will provide temporary shelter and processing services for families. They include over 1,200 beds and other necessary services. And Americans are starting to receive the latest round of stimulus checks, but that's not everyone who's getting the money. A new analysis reveals that over $4 billion will also go to illegal immigrants. The Center for Immigration Studies estimates that 2.65 million illegal immigrants have social security numbers. This is what allows them to receive stimulus checks. It includes people under DACA and temporary protected status recipients. But 
But not included in that number is the near 2 million immigrants that are thought to use social security numbers that don't match their names. And nearly 600,000 who have social security numbers from when they were, illeg were legally in the country but overstayed their visa. The director of research for the center says that so many illegal immigrants are issued a social security number is a clear indication that America is not serious about enforcing its immigration laws. People are calling for the end of violence and discrimination against Asian Americans following the Atlanta spa shootings last week. Several groups held a rally in Washington, D.C. over the weekend. NTD's Kitty Wong has the details. Several civil rights organizations and Asian groups held a rally at McPherson Square in D.C. on Sunday afternoon, calling attention to the safety and discrimination of Asians. You know, with the COVID pandemic, we were seeing a rise in anti-Asian racism. Um, and, you know, this is an issue that we've been speaking out about over the last year. Last Tuesday's shootings in Atlanta stoked this new round of protests, as six of the eight people killed were Asian women. However, authorities have not established whether the attacks were racially motivated. Wen Huang, a resident of Rockville, Maryland, says she personally feels her community is peaceful and respectful, as one-third of the population is Asian, but she came out for her kids. For my kids' generation, um, I don't want them to grow up in, uh, in a danger or being unrespected by other um, people. Huang says the mainstream media is mostly focusing on hate crimes against Asians, but another form of discrimination seems to be largely ignored admissions bias against Asian American students by top institutions. Wen Huang calls this a two-way discrimination. In one way, is we are kind of a minority being weak, but on the other side, our kids are working so hard. They're being uh, punished for, being, for working so hard. So um, that's another thing that we are really worried about. Early last month, the Biden administration quietly dropped a lawsuit accusing Yale University of discriminating against Asian and white applicants in undergraduate admissions. Reporting by Kitty Wong, NTD News. Police officers face more criticism and hostility from millions of Americans and activist groups, but one salon owner is hosting a fundraiser to support them. NTD's Don Tran has the details. Police officers vow to serve and protect. That means looking out for the people and businesses in their communities, like this hair salon in Chicago. Katie Shiko, the owner of the salon, has lived in Chicago for over 20 years. She hosted a fundraising campaign on Sunday to show her gratitude to the police officers who keep her and others safe. So this is my way to give back to them. In 2020, 15% more Chicago police officers retired than the year before. The same trend happened in other major cities like New York and Minneapolis. In early March, two Chicago police officers committed suicide in one week. Rob McDonald had a friend who was a police officer. He committed suicide two years ago. There's a level of, of stress and a level of, um, you know, just... Uh, an extra layer of difficulty for doing a job that's already difficult. One police officer and his wife said it has been a very difficult and stressful year for them. Because when you're working uh, 12 and 19 days in a row without having off, and those days that you're working are 12 hour days, uh, you know, it, um, it wears you down and wears your family down. You have to pull it together. You have to be supportive and you have to be strong for your husband who's doing a really hard job and sees a lot of things that people don't see and I don't think people understand. Schickel said there's been a lot of negative coverage of police officers and that officers are underappreciated for what they do. Police, I think that, you know, we need to counteract that with positiveness and an appreciation and, and gratitude for, for the job that they do every day for all of us. Shikul's hair salon charged every haircut $25 on Sunday, and she's keeping none of it for herself. The donations proceeds will all go to the Chicago Police Memorial Foundation to purchase new bulletproof vests for Chicago Police Department officers. Don Tran, NTD News. And the country continues to reopen. Fitness centers in New York City can now offer in-person classes again. But not everyone's happy about it, including the mayor. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story.
Today, in-person classes like kickboxing, for example, are reopening in New York City. So gyms have been open for quite some time, but in-person classes were still banned. Last week, instructors from the yoga, Pilates and dance industry gathered in front of City Hall to protest that. They say they were forgotten. New Yorkers we spoke with had mixed reactions to the city's current speed of reopening. We should wait till vaccines are out for everyone um, and then reopen. Like, I also think it's crazy people are eating inside already. Um, I don't think it's time for that yet. I go to the gym with my daughter and we love it. So we're really happy it's open. Uh, I think most of them are closed arbitrarily without much thought or science behind it. Just the politicians being afraid to have it open. I just want the pandemic to be behind us so we can get rid of these masks and like live like normal human beings again. Neighboring New Jersey is halting its reopening. The Garden State has the highest per capita number in cases nationwide. New York City's mayor would like to follow their lead when it comes to indoor dining and other industries. In the city now, getting up to 50 percent, uh, certainly we got to stop there. That would be my strong view. The mayor is against bringing back in-person classes. His health team says it's dangerous because people are very close to each other and masks could slip off their sweaty hats. But the governor overruled the mayor's decision, giving in-person classes a pass. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Major U.S. cities are getting more congested, according to a global ranking. Some cities rank even higher than before. Experts say the pandemic might have had something to do with it. NTD's Don Tran reports. In 2020, some of the biggest American cities made it to the top in the country and the world when it comes to traffic congestion. New York City specifically rose from fourth to first place, which means more time sitting in traffic and more hours wasted. Analytics firm Enrix found that New York City drivers lost 100 hours to traffic congestions last year. And one of the city's roads was the second most congested in the country. A professor at Northwestern University said traffic congestion increased in New York City because of the pandemic. People got off of transit because of fear of, co of spreading COVID-19. And then as opportunities came to gain to the city and get back to work, uh, those that could more of them chose the car than, had, than had, had been using the car before. Coming in second place is Philadelphia. Drivers there lost an average of 94 hours in traffic last year. Some people in Philadelphia are surprised and even skeptical that their city was at the top of the list. I thought there would be other countries before that, or other cities even. But uh, I, guess, I guess it is what it is, and maybe it depends on how it was measured. Um, I'm from India, and, and uh, Indian cities are very overcrowded. So um, I thought the traffic pattern in India is much worse than here. So I'm really surprised that Philadelphia ranks so high. I see traffic moving fine. You know, it's the other problems besides this. The report also found that traffic jams cost the everyday Philadelphian over $1,000. A professor at the University of Alberta gave a few suggestions to reduce traffic jams. In some cities where you've got the capacity building infrastructure to you know, put in more lanes, uh, do bypasses and so on, that help, helps a lot, although it's very expensive. In places like New York where you're really quite constrained, uh, basically it's getting people onto transit or getting people to, to simply not travel. Some of the people in Philadelphia said that traffic congestion isn't the real problem. They said the real problem is the filthy conditions and the abuse of drugs in public transit systems. Don Tran, NTD News. Coming up, a new crime bill has been raising safety concerns in California. It could change the definition of petty theft in the state. And we take a look at one of the West Coast's natural wonders. A huge yearly migration is underway, but as people flock to see the traveling birds, locals voice their concerns. It's the birds and the business in just a moment on NTD News. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call 
and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever, just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. Crime bill in California seeks to clarify the difference between a petty theft charge and felony robbery. What could this mean for the state? NTD's Jason Blair has the details. Under Senate Bill 82, some robberies could be reduced to petty theft if they don't involve deadly weapons, serious injuries, and the value of the property taken does not exceed $950. Some leaders are saying it would make Californians less safe and encourage criminals to be bolder. At a time when we have so many highly visible cases of robbery here, we need more protection. But this bill is just going the opposite direction. There's also concern that violent crime could go unpunished because the legal definition of serious injury is very specific. That means in a lot of cases, when the victim suffers with a black eye, a bloody nose, bruises, and so forth, you know, it, it would still be considered as uh, non-violent petty theft under SB 82. The bill was introduced by California State Senator Nancy Skinner. She says California's robbery statute is 150 years old, and SB 82 will bring more clarity to the definition of petty theft. But what we are finding is because, again, the lack of clarity between the distinction that there are people being charged with felony robbery that judges even feel are, should not, is not appropriate. District Attorney Dan Dow wrote a letter in opposition of the bill. He stated the definition of violent robbery involves the use of force or fear and has never required a weapon or actual bodily injury. He states that SB 82 will essentially eliminate the crime of unarmed robbery by replacing it with petty theft. The bill has been passed by the Public Safety Committee and is now waiting to be heard by the Senate Appropriations Committee. Jason Blair, NTD News, San Francisco. A private women's college in California will stop enrolling new students after this fall, citing low enrollment and funding. Here's NTD's Eileen Eng with the details. Mills College, a private liberal arts and sciences college for women in Oakland, California, announced last week that it will not be taking new students after fall this year. They cited declining enrollment, budget deficits, and pandemic challenges as reasons for its decision. Mills intends to begin the shift from being a standalone degree-granting college to becoming an institute that will sustain the essence of Mills College and continue to do what Mills does best, cultivate women's leadership, pursue racial and gender equity, and offer transformative learning and research opportunities to those underserved by other institutions. After nearly 170 years, the school will accept its last undergraduate students. The last graduating class will likely be 2023. During this transition, the school will create options for students to obtain degrees at Mills College or transfer to another college or university. Eileen Eng, NTD News, California. In Washington State, one of the greatest natural wonders is the annual departure of migrating birds in the spring. But the yearly event has brought another issue to the natural environment. NTD's Echo Lou has more on the birds. Washington's Skagit Valley is where hundreds of thousands of migratory birds call home. 
Every March, they leave from here on their annual migration to Russia. The 3,000-mile journey brings more than massive flocks, as locals also come to see the birds in their natural habitat. And uh, bird watching is the fastest based, uh, the fastest growing nature-based activity in the United States, and so. Andrew Miller, a local entrepreneur, is a firm believer that the birds bring revenue. But as a farmer, Miller also voices his concerns. Problem, but if there's a farmer who has put in uh, winter wheat and you know 20,000 snow geese decide that that's what they want to have for breakfast, well then that's considerable economic loss for that farmer. Conservationists like Jed Holmes also notice issues with the birds. When the numbers get uh, above a certain level, um, it's no longer sustainable. Holmes says the estimated number of birds could be over 150,000 within 50 miles around Skagit Valley. Holmes mentioned options to control the population. You know, one of the things when they're thinking about, you know, harvestable hunting numbers, they're thinking about, you know, not letting, not letting those populations get too high. Holmes so, works with a group of people to embrace economic opportunity to protect both the land and farmers and educate visitors. He is also the co-founder of Birds of Winter. Stephanie Fernandez is part of the group. Yeah, so that's one of the things I like to teach on my, during my birding tours, is how to be uh, a responsible birder. Miller pointed out that people trespass on private property to see the birds. The other issue is really access, and that's, that's something that I think farmers uh, generally Unless it's going to benefit them, it's only risk to have people, uh, especially uninvited, and that would be the number. Fernandez has educated people about nature during her 30 plus years of eco tour guiding. She says people should be more respectful. Keep your distance to birds. Also, you need to respect their habitat they're in because habitats can be very fragile, or habitat can be a private land like these farmlands. Fernandez said some birders claim that they don't see any sign. The Wildlife Regional Program posts signs indicating both public and private property. Regardless of what the people in Skagit Valley do, the thousands of birds will continue their yearly travels. Reporting by Echo Liu, NTD News, Washington. Still to come, debates run hot on why Chinese diplomats were so aggressive during their first meeting with Biden officials. An expert sheds light on a possible message behind their actions. And China buys more oil from Iran and Venezuela. The increased imports from China allow the two countries to circumvent U.S. sanctions, throwing a wrench in the Biden administration's foreign policy plans. Find out more in just a moment on NTD News. Following the first high-level meeting between China and the U.S. under Biden, the debate is ongoing over why the Chinese diplomats behaved the way they did. One expert says Beijing's diplomat is actually trying to tell the world an important message about his boss's dark ambitions. NTD's Juliet Song has the details. How did the talks go? Discussions are hot following the first showdown between the Biden administration and Beijing. Top diplomats from both sides had their first in-person meeting last week. But people are still talking about what's behind some unexpected behavior from the Chinese Communist Party's or CCP's side. Prior to the meeting, both sides had agreed on two-minute-long opening remarks. The U.S. side acted as planned, but top Chinese diplomat Yang Jiechi broke the deal, going on a 16-minute-long monologue and aggressively throwing out accusations toward the U.S. One interpretation being passed around suggests China was putting on a show for its domestic audience. That way, the regime officials would be praised back at home for humiliating the U.S. But a China expert holds a different view. He's using this opportunity, an opportunity where he held the world's attention, to share a message from the Chinese leader. So what's the core message? The message is that the Chinese Communist Party will stop recognizing that the U.S. is the world's leader, and that the CCP also won't follow international rules laid out by the U.S. On top of this, the CCP will promote its own values and directives around the world. Tang says one section of the Chinese diplomat's long speech is particularly telling. In it, Yang said, the U.S. does not represent the world, it only represents the government of the United States. The Chinese diplomat went on to say that neither the U.S. nor the West represent the international opinion. He later added that he thinks a number of countries don't agree with American values or recognize the U.S. as a global leader. The diplomat also stressed one point, 
that China follows the international order set by the United Nations. But many of the key organs of the United Nations and many of their critical policies are controlled by the CCP. Tang says the diplomat's comments directly challenge the United States' ideology and value system. The CCP is denying the United States legitimacy. It's also denying the Western values represented by the United States. Put simply, what the Chinese leader wants to say is, the Western values of democracy and freedom are current, but the totalitarian system represented by the CCP and its values is what will lead the future. He called the diplomat statement a declaration of challenge toward Western values. Basically, the CCP is openly declaring that it seeks to dominate the world and promote its system to the entire world in the future. Tan explained that the aggressive speech also served another purpose, to test the Biden administration's bottom line. He says the speech pushed White House officials, looking to see how they'd respond in the face of Beijing's aggressive diplomacy. Juliet Song, NTD News. Switzerland unveiled its first-ever strategy aimed at dealing with China late last week. The report highlighted two key issues, human rights dialogue and trade interests. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. In its first-ever report on China policy strategy, Switzerland says it wants to create greater coherence with communist China. It also indicates at the same time there are, quote, clear differences in values between the two countries. The Central European nation also emphasizes human rights abuses in communist China. Beijing's embassy in Switzerland denounces the report in response, but Chinese media react differently. Last Friday, the Swiss foreign minister presented the country's China policy for 2021 to 2024. He says human rights dialogue and trade interests are the two key issues. Human rights dialogue and at the same time Switzerland's third most important trading partner. These two keywords have long characterized Switzerland's relationship with China. Human rights dialogue between Switzerland and communist China was suspended in 2018. Switzerland is now willing to continue the dialogue. The foreign minister says, quote, a difficult dialogue is better than no dialogue. He points out that Beijing's willingness to have the dialogue has dropped, while the human rights situation in China got worse. But Amnesty International's annual report suggests that the human rights situation in China has been worsening year after year. This is true even when the regime had human rights dialogues with Western countries. Another key area in the report is the economy. It includes the promotion of trade, investment, export and tourism. This approach echoes the Swiss-China high-level meeting earlier this month. Switzerland's finance minister and the Chinese regime's vice premier met and agreed to deepen bilateral ties in stock market trading, asset management and other areas. Both countries' central banks are also working on projects for digital money. Beijing's embassy in Switzerland responds to the new China policy by claiming that China has always attached great importance to human rights protection. And it criticizes Switzerland for, quote, sending a wrong signal to the outside world. But some Chinese media interpret Switzerland's strategy as something positive. China Business News says in an article that Switzerland prioritizes China in foreign policy. The article leaves out the part about different values, but adds an interview with the vice chairman of a Chinese business association in Switzerland. The vice chairman praises the Swiss-China Free Trade Agreement as being very good for China. China is buying more oil from both Iran and Venezuela on the black market. It's a test for Biden's foreign policies. NTD's Patrick Hayden reports. The Wall Street Journal reports China has increased its oil imports from Iran and Venezuela sharply, citing U.S. officials. One industry expert says in a period of constrained supply, China can get discounted oil on the black market from these countries. If the oil's on the market, they'll buy it. Why would they care what the U.S. thinks? The U.S. and China are at a low point in their relationships. China can basically put the finger in the eye of the U.S. Secretary of State in Alaska, put the finger in the eye of the president, Joe Biden, and, and that's what they're doing because they can. It's as simple as that. Data company Pleca says China is expected to import over 900,000 barrels a day from Iran this month. 
That be the highest amount since the U.S. imposed an oil embargo against Iran two years ago. The U.S. has lost any influence with respect to Iran or Venezuela over the last 20 years. This is not a new phenomenon. I don't lay this blame on Biden. I don't lay the blame on Trump. He says over 20 years ago, Iran and Venezuela went their own way. They have their own destiny in mind. They have their own principles and their own authoritarian prerogatives in mind. And that's what they will pursue. He says there is no central trading information system to track oil trade. So a lot of trading can happen, you know, under the table, behind closed doors, uh, where nobody knows it's happening. And then ships suddenly appear uh, empty, fill up with oil in Iran or Venezuela, and then suddenly disappear, often with a name change or with turning off of the international navigation system. Hofmeister says China views the U.S. as a declining empire and the regime will do what it wants and only follow laws it deems appropriate for itself. He says the U.S. could send out ships to confiscate China's black market oil, but he warns that could create a heightened level of anxiety and international stress, which could have other consequences. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Coming up, another historic figure may be cancelled. This time, it's French Emperor Napoleon. As the 200th anniversary of his death approaches, a New York Times opinion piece urges the French government not to celebrate. And a long dormant volcano erupts near Iceland's capital. Scientists flocked to the area to study it and even had a little fun while they were at it. That and more on NTD News. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, classical, and romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. France's celebrations for the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death are approaching. And some say the events should be cancelled. But it seems the French emperor's supporters will push on. NTD's David Vives has more. Will France's first ever emperor be the next to be cancelled? A New York Times opinion piece on Friday called on the French government not to commemorate Napoleon. The author points out that Napoleon restored slavery to the French Caribbean to build his empire. For the president of Napoleon Foundation, Thierry Lenz, this is indeed a well-known fact. I wrote myself on the question. I am not saying Napoleon was right to do so. He restored slavery for economic reasons at the time and broke a promise that he would not do it. Lenz says there are several reasons behind that. France was the first nation to abolish slavery, but the French emperor turned over on this decree in the Caribbean, where the situation was more complex. The New York Times piece is not the first to make the call to cancel Napoleon. Other groups in France coming from the far left also push the French government not to celebrate the emperor's anniversary. But cancel culture does not have the same momentum in France that it has in the United States. I'm very surprised about this cancel culture, to see Lincoln statues dismantled, Churchill statues dismantled. I can't imagine that happening in France. I discussed it with universities in the U.S. It seems to me that Napoleon still has a great aura there. Lenz says it is always good to improve your understanding of history. He agrees that historians need to revise their perspectives as they learn more of the historic truths. 
He says the calls to ban Napoleon from history books don't come from historians, but from others with an agenda. This is not about looking for the truth of history. The people asking to cancel Napoleon are not historians. They are activists. They don't want to know about the past. They want to change it or even destroy it. We have to resist. The celebrations will take place as planned on May 5th. The French president did not say if he would participate in the celebrations. But so far, the public's support for Napoleon looks to be much bigger than the opposition, which indicates it's unlikely he will be cancelled. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. On Friday night, a volcano that had been dormant for 6,000 years erupted in Iceland. Scientists are at the site studying the phenomenon. NTD's Christina Kim has the story. After weeks of nearly 50,000 earthquakes, a volcano erupted in southwestern Iceland near the capital Reykjavik. Footage shows magma spewing into the air and lava flowing from the eruption site. Researchers and scientists arrived at the site on Sunday to take a closer look. Here at this yeah, most beautiful thing that I have seen, this volcano, we are just making that people are safe and, and yeah, trying to have, let people have distance from the lava. Iceland's large volunteer and search rescue team was at the site to make sure spectators were safe. Some clearly took advantage of the unique situation. Scientists used the lava as a giant grill to cook hot dogs as they studied the volcano. The Icelandic Meteorologist Office says there's no immediate danger to the people or to critical infrastructure. They noted lava fountain activity was low and said mapping of the lava flow is in progress. One geologist explains what to expect from this eruption. Uh, it'll begin to fill up a little bit like a bathtub, and it depends on uh, how long the eruption goes on. He says if the eruption continues on, the lava might spill over into other areas. Reykjavik's international airport was not closed following the eruption, but each airline has to decide for themselves if they want to fly or not. Christina Kim, NTD News. Coming up, one Michigan man turned a tree trunk in his front yard into a symbol of warmth and welcome. It's now tour drawing tourists. And bus tours of the splendid cherry trees blossoming in Tokyo resume after a two-month hiatus. That and more on NTD News. A giant pineapple carved out of a tree trunk has been attracting attention in Michigan. NTD's Sapphire Quarter tells us why a pineapple. After a storm snapped one Michigan resident's tree in half, he could have had the stump removed. Instead, he had it turned into a wood carving. The 10-foot tall carving has been drawing attention to itself. Well, the reason I picked a pineapple was because it's a universal sign of hospitality and welcome. After news of the pineapple sculpture hit Facebook, it had over 16,000 hits in eight hours. Now it's listed on Google Maps. Cole isn't the only one turning his tree trunks into sculptures, however. Another Michigan resident is a professional wood carver. He says the pineapple is an unusual choice. Most people like animals for their wood carvings. It's any types of animals. Uh, usually they want a uh, something that's found locally. He says sometimes they like them for their artistic value. Other times the carvings represent a loved one. The members of the family are uh, have passed. Maybe maybe they had a favorite animal, or maybe the animal reminded them of their loved one. One woman decided to get a carving done in order to preserve the legacy of her red oak tree. I still felt it had some purpose, and so now um, there's a lot of memories with that tree because it, it's, it just has been a part of our family for so many years. She says getting a tree carved is a very unique experience. It's an opportunity to, to leave your, your mark on, on the world. The pineapple has certainly left its mark on the world, as some now consider it a tourist attraction. Cole says people will even stop the car to photograph their kids in front of it. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News. As lockdown restrictions ease up in Japan, tours devoted to blossoming cherry trees get going again. Sakura cherry blossoms, one of the most iconic symbols of Japan. These little flowers are so enchanting, whole bus tours exist to view them. 
and take pictures. Service was halted during Japan's state of emergency because of COVID. After two months, the state of emergency is lifted and the tours are back. There were cherry blossoms blooming. I have been working from home for a long time and had no chance to go out. So this really cheered me up a lot. The buses can be filled to capacity, but Heido Bus Company is only running 10 tours a day. During the 2019 season, 100 tours were running a day. The company says they expect more demand when the virus situation is more stable. Frankly, I'm very happy that we could resume this course, but since there are still many concerns about infections, we cannot strongly publicize and ask people to come. Japan lifted its state of emergency in and around Tokyo after more hospital beds became available. However, to keep infections from rising, some restrictions, such as restaurant curfew, are still in place. I think if the state of emergency wasn't lifted at this time, it would have dragged on for a long time. So I think it's good to end it for now and take other measures in the future so people can mentally prepare themselves. The cherry blossoms will be gone in about three weeks. An Arctic walrus was spotted on a Welsh coast in a rare sighting on Saturday. Animal rescue experts believe it could have been seen previously in Ireland. The walrus was found resting on the rocks along the Pembrokeshire coast, and some animal charities sent animal rescue officers to observe it. They believe it was the same one spotted in Kerry, Ireland, last week, 300 miles away from Pembrokeshire. An officer from Welsh Marine Life Rescue says the walrus, as big as a cow, is a young one as its tusks are about three inches long. She said it looked rather underweight but uninjured. Ellie West from the RSPCA believes the walrus travelled a long way in search of food. Apart from it being very, very, very surreal and very, very unusual, I have to admit my, my main emotion is feeling quite sad that this poor guy's turned up over here on a very, very long journey, very, very far away from home. After a few hours rest, it headed back to sea and swam away. Arctic walruses are very rarely seen in the UK. West says no walrus has been spotted so far south in British waters. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.